Hello, and welcome to Past, the podcast about those who would never rule. I'm Veronica Fortune, and this week's episode is Elizabeth of York, Part 1. This week's subject is a powerful woman in her own right. Without her marriage, Henry VII was unlikely to be able to hold his throne, and it would have been highly unlikely for his children to have had any chance of ruling. When Henry VII took the throne of England after the Battle of Bosworth, or retroactively, the day before, if you were on the wrong side, on the 22nd of August, 1485, he had enough support to win the battle, but without his promise to marry Elizabeth of York, he wouldn't be king for long. He may have claimed the throne by right of conquest, but he remained on the throne through his wife. Elizabeth was the oldest child of Edward IV and his consort, Elizabeth Woodville. Fun fact, they are the only mother-daughter queen consorts of England, which is probably a good thing when you think about it. Her marriage to a man who was, at least in theory, the long-term enemy of her house would protect his claim and those of their descendants. I'll be using Alison Weir's Elizabeth of York, the first Tudor queen, and Amy Lyson's Elizabeth of York, forgotten Tudor queen. Of course, all the earlier works I've used, especially for our last subject, will come up. Oh, and because I can't not fully research things, I also checked up on one important fact via the paper, Tuberculosis in the Female Genital Tract, by Drs. Keshawarni, Mohammed, and Pathak. These next two episodes will be a little longer, because I couldn't quite get three episodes. I'm sorry about that. As you may have noticed in the first bit of this introduction, there will be two Elizabeths in this episode, and they're both important, just as they were in our last episodes. For our subject, I'll refer to her mainly as Elizabeth, sometimes Princess Elizabeth when she was a child, and Queen Elizabeth when she's queen. For her mother, I'll use her full name, Elizabeth Woodville, while she's queen. But just know, I acknowledge her being queen, and a good queen at that, and the dowager queen following the death of her husband. You may also realize that there will be two important Henrys in this episode as well. For the elder, I'll refer to him as Henry Tudor until he becomes king, and then King Henry, or just Henry after that. His son, by Elizabeth, will be called Prince Henry throughout, because, spoilers, his mother will not be alive when he's king. I did consider calling Henry Tudor Henry of Richmond or Henry Richmond, but I decided I'd go with the name expected by modern audiences. During his own lifetime, though, he would have been referred to as Henry of Richmond until he was king, as those of you who listened to his mother's episodes would know. Elizabeth was born on the 11th of February, 1466, in Westminster Palace. She was the daughter of Edward IV and Elizabeth Woodville. She was the first shared child of her parents, but her mother's third legitimate child. Her father might have had up to two illegitimate children at this point. He does end up having a few. She was also the first princess born to a king since Edward III's youngest daughter Margaret in 1346. Remember, Henry IV's children had been born before he became king. The story of Elizabeth of York's parents' first meeting is often romanticized. Two young unbelievably attractive people meeting under an oak tree, while Elizabeth Woodville came to beseech the young king for a return of her late husband's properties and titles. The only problem? It's probably not true at all. Elizabeth Woodville's first husband, Sir John Grey, was never attained, and it appears that she had nothing to beg for. In all reality, Elizabeth Woodville's mother, Jaquetta of Luxembourg, had been an active member of court during her first marriage to John, Duke of Bedford, Henry VI's uncle. Even after Bedford's death, Jaquetta had been active in court. You'll remember me discussing Jaquetta's second marriage in Richard III, Duke of York's episodes. Jaquetta had scandalously married Richard Woodville, a squire. Now, I'd like to defend Richard Woodville. While not a noble, he was a competent military leader who came from a family of competent political leaders, military leaders, who were also diplomats. While he didn't have title, he was perfectly popular in court, and Henry VI eventually forgave his aunt for her impulsive decision. This means that the Woodville couple and their vast number of children would have been present in court. It's possible that Edward, then Earl of March, had met Elizabeth Woodville at a much earlier point. Maybe it was under an oak tree, but it wasn't when she was begging her king. He was likely just the son of a duke when they met. Elizabeth Woodville was unique. She was the first English queen consort of England since Edith of Mercia, Harold Godwinson's wife, 
Elizabeth Woodville was a descendant of Charlemagne, but that was all through her mother's line. Her father was a lowly common squire. Now, I might go on a little rant here, but I despise the word grasping. I think that people should try to better themselves if they want, especially if they can do so without hurting others. This squire was, according to nobility, nobody, but his father was actually a respected politician. I think calling someone grasping is unnecessary unless you want to call William the Bastard grasping, because he used a dubious claim to England to invade and basically rip apart the functions of a country. That's grasping. Elizabeth Woodville's family was called grasping throughout Edward IV's reign. Edward IV's closest advisor, Richard Neville, Earl of Warwick, the kingmaker, was likely the first to make that accusation. Warwick had been negotiating for Edward IV to marry a French princess to make peace between the two countries, but was blindsided by Edward IV's marriage to Elizabeth Woodville. I do understand being upset about this. It wasn't kind on Edward's part. But Warwick taking it out on the Woodvilles was a bit unfair. I mean, we can also call Warwick grasping. His father was a younger son who had been married to a wealthy heiress who was lacking brothers. Warwick's own marriage was just as grasping. I guess it's only okay to do if you're descended from John of Gaunt? Edward IV's own mother, Cecily Neville, Warwick's aunt, was disgusted by her son's marriage. Princess Elizabeth's father had been king for five years, and her parents had been married for a year and ten months prior to her birth. At least, supposedly. (laughs) While the royal couple had hoped for a son as their first child, both parents were pleased with their healthy daughter. Like all the royalty of their time period, the royal couple was described as beautiful. But for once, we have realistic, contemporary, or near-contemporary portraits that bear this out. Elizabeth's mother appears to be attractive by the standards of the time, which, interestingly, included moving the hairline further back than would naturally occur and styling the eyebrows low. Elizabeth's father has what can only be described as a rather plantagenet look. Despite the controversy about her parents' marriage, Her mother was actually a well-suited queen consort. She was religiously devout, supportive of her husband, charitable while being economic within her household, and even turned a blind eye to her husband's many infidelities. As one of 13 siblings, she brought a large number of her sisters and brothers to court with her. While her family may have bumped heads with the established magnates, by all accounts, Princess Elizabeth's uncles, for the most part, were dedicated and loyal to the king, and supportive of his aims. Elizabeth Woodville's older sons were still boys at the time of her second marriage, but will eventually become part of this managing Woodville cohort. Princess Elizabeth's older brothers, Thomas and Richard, were 11 and 9 years older than her. Princess Elizabeth spent a great deal of her childhood at Sheen Palace, her mother's favorite residence. She would spend holidays at court or traveling with her parents. There are actually records of her daily routines. There was a lot of mass. Religion was a huge part of life during these times, and the higher classes were expected to show this both publicly and privately. The king and queen would have two further daughters, Mary and Cecily, in 1467 and 1469. Princess Elizabeth and her sisters would have been taught that they were the weaker sex, which was normal at the time. Women were expected to be meeker, quieter, and conforming. If women didn't meet these expectations, they would have been seen as domineering or going against God and nature. Despite this level of sexism, Elizabeth and her sisters were also taught to read and write in both English and French, though her spoken French was apparently mediocre. The princess, throughout her life, was shown to have a love of reading. Multiple books survive with her inscription on them. She appeared to regularly share books with her sisters and her mother, and in future, her mother-in-law. The childhood of the royal children was all that was expected until July of 1469. This is when Warwick and the king's younger brother, George, Duke of Clarence, rebelled against the king. After the Yorkist losses to the Neville forces at the Battle of Edgecote Moor, Edward was held by Warwick. Weeks later, on the 12th of August, Warwick summarily executed Richard Woodville, Princess Elizabeth's grandfather, and John Woodville, one of her uncles. They originally tried to put Clarence on the throne in Edward's place. When this failed, they eventually reconciled with the king. Well, they claimed to. After his release, Edward had Princess Elizabeth declared his heir apparent, 
the first time a daughter had been declared such since the Empress Matilda. Other women had been heir presumptive, but not officially heir apparent. Queen Elizabeth was forced to greet Warwick in court over Christmas of 1469. To try to put a stop to Clarence's ambitions, Edward offered to betroth Princess Elizabeth to Warwick's nephew, George Neville. This betrothal was formalized in January of 1470. Young George was five at the time, and Elizabeth was three. The young man was elevated to the Duke of Bedford. This was the first of Elizabeth's three engagements. The hope was that Warwick would be more likely to support his nephew over his cousin. While they had claimed to be loyal, in reality, Warwick and Clarence, well, were still scheming. Warwick and Clarence were trying to use the rumor that Edward IV was illegitimate due to the timing of his birth. You may remember this from his father's episodes. Remember, Parliament has the say on who's king, not blood, and for the moment, Parliament was behind King Edward. Since they weren't done scheming, Warwick and Clarence continued to make plans. The pair fled to France in May of 1470. Warwick, king-making, or attempting to, returned to England at the head of an army in September of that year. Hopefully you remember what happened in France from Edward of Westminster's episode. King Edward was forced to flee to Bruges. Oh, and there's one more huge thing I almost forgot to share with you. At some point, while Warwick was in control in August of 1469, Jaquetta of Luxembourg, Princess Elizabeth's grandmother, was charged with witchcraft. I did say it would come up again. This would have been a terrifying accusation for all the royal women. Part of the accusation included crediting Jaquetta's magic with allowing her daughter to seduce King Edward. These charges were dismissed quickly, but they would have been embarrassing for the entire royal family. While Elizabeth's father was fighting for his throne, well, running for his life and then fighting for his throne, she, her sisters, and their very pregnant mother were in Westminster Abbey in Sanctuary. Originally, they had been planning to stay in the tower while the king was fighting his brother and cousin, but due to his forced evacuation from England, they were also forced to change plans. Since you know what happened from a battle standpoint from Edward of Westminster's episode, I'll focus on Princess Elizabeth's story. While every historical, fictional representation I've seen of Sanctuary shows the Yorkist ladies living in a dirt-floored basement right next to the river, It appears that they were in fact housed in the abbot's rooms. These were well appointed. Had they been in the common area of sanctuary, it would have been rather unsafe for them due to the members of society who were regularly in sanctuary. While they would have been terrified for the king, they would have been safe and well cared for. Her mother gave birth to Edward, the future Edward V, on the 1st of November, 1470. Henry VI had been redeclared king on the 3rd of October, 1470. His council, likely acting on his request, remember, Henry had a kind streak that should never be overlooked, saw to it that the sometime Queen Elizabeth's medical needs were looked after. The prince was baptized at the abbot's house. He had been sickly, and waiting for regal baptism probably wasn't suggested. The abbot, Thomas Myling, and the prior, John Eastney, stood as Prince Edward's godfathers. Not nearly as sumptuous as Princess Elizabeth's christening, but it did the job. Thomas Myling would be appointed the Bishop of Hereford in 1474. This was an unusual appointment. Abbots usually stayed abbots, but Edward IV wanted to thank Myling for his help during this period. Edward IV defeated Warwick's forces at the Battle of Barnet on the 14th of April, 1471, and Princess Elizabeth, her mother, sisters, and brand new baby brother were able to leave sanctuary. Elizabeth watched her mother overcome with emotions from her father's return. While her father was back, things weren't completely normal. On the 12th of May, Thomas Neville, Warwick's cousin, but surprisingly a longtime supporter of Margaret of Anjou, known as the Bastard of Falkenberg, sailed up the Thames with 17,000 men. He claimed he was coming to free the rightful king, Henry VI. Falkenberg burnt Southwark when his demands to allow his men to enter London were denied. His assault and the bombardment of London failed, but he didn't give up. Elizabeth's uncle, Edward Woodville, was able to trick Falkenberg, and King Edward would eventually be able to capture him. On the 21st of May, 1471, Henry VI died of unknown means. Falkenberg was executed in September of 1471. For a time, Elizabeth's life would be relatively stable. 
at least until right before adulthood. In probably the least shocking news ever, after her father's win, her betrothal was called off. Her fiancé may have been five, but his father had rebelled against hers, and you don't really want that marrying into the family, right? Less than a year after her father's return, Elizabeth's mother gave birth to another child, a girl, in April of 1472. Sadly, this would be the first of the royal couple's children to die. She wouldn't even make it to Christmas. The king and queen, though, were likely pregnant when their young daughter passed. Princess Elizabeth's younger brother, Richard, was born in mid-August 1473. Yes, that means that Elizabeth had an older brother named Richard and a younger brother named Richard. It appears that one was named after his maternal grandfather and the other named after his paternal grandfather. In 1472, there was a wedding in the family. Richard of Gloucester, King Edward's youngest brother, married Anne Neville, the daughter of Warwick, and the widow of Edward of Westminster on the 12th of July. Gloucester had actually grown up in Warwick's house and was rather close to his cousin. Due to Gloucester's young age at the time of his father's death, he was only eight. Warwick was a father figure to him. Yes, the couple were first cousins. After all, everyone is related. Papal dispensation was received. Elizabeth's father had spent part of his exile in Bruges, which was controlled by the Burgundians. You'll remember that his sister, Margaret of York, had married Charles the Bold in July of 1468. This is one of the many things that had originally enraged Warwick. Charles the Bold, yes, I love Burgundian supercase, will actually be alive for a few more years at this point in our story. The court of Burgundy was well, glittering. It was everything one would expect of a medieval court of an early Renaissance duke who was aiming to become a king. Charles the Bold was a lover of art, music, culture, learning, and life from everything I've read. Like his progenitors, he wanted to make Burgundy a great place. And Edward's time in his brother-in-law's court was something he brought back with him on his triumphant return to England. He created a black book no, not that kind, to govern the goings-on in his household. This allowed him to create his own version of the Burgundian court. Princess Elizabeth's future husband would follow a similar procedure, with the help of his mother. One of the greatest concerns of Elizabeth's life, and her parents' lives, was who she would marry. Since her earlier betrothal had failed spectacularly, finding a new husband was a goal. Surprisingly, her sister Cecily was the next daughter to be officially engaged. Elizabeth was finally betrothed on August of 1475 to Charles, the Dauphin of France, the son of Louis XI. Their betrothal was sealed with the Treaty of Piquigny, which awarded Edward IV a huge sum of money not to invade France and to give up his claim to the country. It also ransomed former Queen Margaret of Anjou for an equally huge sum of money. Elizabeth would receive, once she was married, an annual payment of £60,000 which is about 30 million pounds as of 2013. She was nine at the time. Her future husband was five, but she wouldn't be moving to France until she was 12. While girls were allowed by the church to be married at the age of 12, the age for boys was 14. So Elizabeth would be 18 before she was actually married. This would give her some time to adjust to court in theory. While she wasn't married yet, her family treated her as though she were the future queen of France. Had this marriage gone through, she would have been the first post-conquest English princess to become a queen of France, or a French kingdom. The previous English princess was Edgifu of Wessex, who was the daughter of Edward the Elder, Alfred the Great's son and heir. Before I get too far into the further narrative, Elizabeth's parents would have four further children after the birth of Richard. Anne, George, Catherine, and Bridget between 1475 and 1480. George sadly died before the age of three. Elizabeth, her mother, and an aunt were made ladies of the Order of the Garter in 1477, when she was 11. Elizabeth's marriage plans were temporarily destabilized around the same time. In January of that year, Charles the Bold, Duke of Burgundy, died in Nancy during a seemingly minor battle. His death left his extreme wealth in the hands of his daughter, Mary the Rich. How is that for a super -kay? Mary was unmarried and in the care of Elizabeth's aunt, Mary's stepmother, Margaret. Margaret originally schemed to marry Clarence, who was a widow at this point, to Mary. 
this would have, without a doubt, led to war between, well, most of Europe? This didn't happen, of course. But if it had, Clarence could have used Mary's distant Lancastrian claim to make an attempt on the English throne. Thankfully, Edward didn't have to do much to stop it, because Louis XI invaded Burgundy, and at least slowed things down. Mary the Rich ended up marrying Archduke Maximilian of Austria, who would eventually become the Holy Roman Emperor. Clarence was upset with the death of his wife in 1476. I mentioned his widowhood earlier. In his grief, he lashed out at his sister-in-law, Elizabeth Woodville. Clarence was really good at stirring things up, and just kept pushing after this. He was arrested in June of 1477. He was then executed in February of 1478. This execution was private, and the rumor started that he was drowned in a butt of wine. It's slightly supported by his daughter's choice of jewelry. In her portraits, she would include a bracelet with a wine cask on it. With his death, his two children, Edward, yes, another Edward, and Margaret, she of the wine cask bracelet, were sent to Sheen Palace to be raised with Elizabeth and her siblings. Their father had been attained, so the young Edward would not become a duke, but he inherited the Warwick title from his mother. Elizabeth and her cousin Margaret were apparently close throughout their lives. Between Clarence's arrest and execution, the royal family celebrated the first marriage of their children. No, not Elizabeth's. Instead, her four-year-old brother Richard, now Duke of York, was wed to Anne Mowbray, who was five. Anne was the heiress of the vast Norfolk fortune. The marriage was short-lived, though. The bride died at eight in 1481 which is a reminder of how risky life was at this time. Apparently, Richard kept her property. And we've come to 1478. Elizabeth is now 12, and it's time for her to go to France. Right? Well, Louis didn't send for his supposed future daughter-in-law. He vacillated, looking for other options. He was likely worried that Edward would try to attack France. Edward sent representatives to France to get things moving. He wanted the wedding to go ahead. Edward also asked that Elizabeth be given her funds from France, her jointure. Now, as far as I can find, their treaty did state she'd get it upon marriage. At the end of the day, though, it looks like Louis was using the match with England not to land his son a bride, but to prevent England from assisting the successor to the Burgundian faction, the Habsburgs. You might have heard of them. The marriage portion of the treaty wasn't broken, yet, but Louis only offered to send a small portion of Elizabeth's funding over, a little more than one-thirtieth of it. Louis began negotiations with James III of Scotland for his daughter Mary. Interestingly, in 1474, Cecily, Elizabeth's younger sister, had been betrothed to James's son, the future James IV of Scotland. While this marriage wouldn't work out, someone close to Elizabeth would eventually marry James IV as you probably know already. And what I find the most egregious part of this French-Scottish marriage negotiations, Louis XI's first wife, Margaret Stuart, had been James III's aunt, and Louis had been properly unkind to her. It really shows that these marriage negotiations rarely took into account the actual emotions of those being negotiated for. Hostages married to their jailers and all that good stuff. While Elizabeth was waiting to hear what would happen with her planned marriage, her younger siblings were getting engaged left and right. Prince Edward was engaged to Anne of Brittany, the heiress to the Duchy of Brittany. Mary was betrothed to Frederick of Denmark. Cecily was requested to be sent to Scotland. Louis XI was still worried Edward would attack him, but he got lucky. Instead, Scotland made a move on England. In 1481, James III started leading raids over the border. Edward raised troops and was requested by the Habsburgs to send them to Burgundy. Instead, Edward sent these troops to stop the Scots. Edward and Louis reconfirmed their treaty in autumn of 1481. Sadly for the royal family, 1482 would lead to the falling apart of many of Edward's plans. In May, Elizabeth's sister Mary died at 15. It was heartbreaking for the family and would have been horrible for Elizabeth. This was her closest in age sibling, and they had grown up together. Scotland threw a further spanner into the works when James III's brother, Alexander, escaped from prison in Scotland and fled to England. 
He convinced Edward IV to support his attempts to overthrow his brother. Edward broke off Cecily's engagement to James III's son, the future James IV, and she was betrothed to Alexander. This engagement was called off once Alexander overthrew his brother and took him captive. While England would come to terms with James and Alexander, they got Berwick back, and Cecily was re-engaged to Prince James. It was messy. (laughs) This engagement would be called off in October that year. And in December, the worst came. Much earlier that year, Mary the Rich had died in a horrific riding accident. Her death led to her husband needing to shore up his alliances. He reached out to Louis XI, and in December of 1482, Elizabeth and Charles's betrothal was officially ended, and the Dauphin was betrothed to Margaret of Burgundy. In addition to not getting to be Queen of France, Elizabeth's father lost his lucrative French pension. It would have been embarrassing and hurtful for the princess. Being a queen was pretty much the highest thing a princess could aspire to in these days. 1482 ended on a nice note, though. The entire royal family was together for Christmas. This would, of course, be bittersweet, though. It was the last recorded instance of the royal York children being together. Fate said, hold my beer. Princess Elizabeth's life was thrown into turmoil in April 1483. In fact, the entire English court and country were tossed into a mess. On the 9th of that month, Edward IV died at only 40, well, weeks away from being 41. Elizabeth was only 17. Elizabeth's brother, Prince Edward, who was only 12, was declared king on the 11th of April as Edward V. I've mentioned Elizabeth's maternal uncles a few times in this episode, but I should go into a bit more on them now, at least the surviving ones. Her oldest uncle, Anthony, had inherited the earldom of Rivers in 1469 when Richard Woodville was executed. His brother, Lionel, had been appointed the Bishop of Salisbury in 1482. The next, Richard, was the least well-known, but had served Edward's throne well, according to everything I can find. And her youngest uncle, Edward, was the closest to Anthony and accompanied him on his many overseas trips. He also helped with the Scottish campaign. Of the four, the one I want to focus on is the oldest, Anthony. He had served as the governor of Prince Edward's household in Ludlow. This meant that the future king was basically raised by his maternal uncle. From all I can find, Anthony was a good military leader and a thoughtful man, educated and a lover of tournaments and everything a man of his class should be. He was a great person to help raise Prince Edward. Most importantly, due to his position in the prince's household, when Edward IV died, he was in possession of the person of the new king. This meant that all the royal children were in possession of either their mother, Elizabeth Woodville, or her brother. The plan was for Prince Edward, now Edward V, to be crowned on the 4th of May. His mother even started preparing his coronation robes. Princess Elizabeth's only surviving paternal uncle, Richard of Gloucester, wasn't informed immediately of the king's death, which is an odd choice because Edward IV had declared him the young king's protector. Instead, the leading councillors agreed to appoint a council to help the young king lead with Gloucester in a leading role. Gloucester learned of his brother's death from his close companion, William Lord Hastings. I don't want to go into all the detail that happened next, but I have to go into some of it. Gloucester and his men headed south to intercept young Edward, his uncle Anthony, and Edward's half-brother Richard Grey, as they were headed to London. He met them at Stony Stratford on the 29th of April, after a perfectly cordial greeting and meal, Overnight, Gloucester had young Edward's Woodville supporters arrested. He took the young king into his control. The young king ordered his uncle and half-brother and other supporters be freed, but Gloucester ignored his commands. News reached Elizabeth and her mother on the 30th of April. Her mother quickly packed. Elizabeth, her mother, and her siblings, save Edward, of course, fled to Westminster Abbey. Thomas, her oldest half-brother, and their uncle, Lionel, the Bishop of Salisbury, joined them not long after. Instead of the young king being crowned on the 4th of May, he rode into the city with his uncle that day. At first, Gloucester protected young Edward's rights and made it appear as though he was to be crowned. Gloucester even saw to it that charters and papers were issued in the young king's name. Being in sanctuary, waiting to hear news of her brother or see him again would have been a horrible wait. 
Gloucester set the young king's coronation for the 24th of June, 1483. As many of you know, this crowning would never happen. The next bit doesn't include much about Elizabeth, but it's important to understand the part of her life that follows. She is in sanctuary, questioning her own security and safety, likely worried about her brothers. Remember, one is the king, but another is being held prisoner, and her uncle, who's being held prisoner with her brother. Instead of being crowned, the prince was moved to the tower for his comfort on the 29th of May. Now we hear the tower today and think it's a bad thing, a place where people are taken to await execution, but it wasn't in that day. Yes, there was a prison within its walls, but remember, there was a prison at Margaret Beaufort's country palace. And at this time, it was luxurious and a common place for the royal family to live. It was especially common to stay there before crowning. The council was worried about the remainder of the royal family staying in sanctuary, but for the moment, nothing was done about it. On the 8th of June, someone informed Gloucester that they had witnessed the marriage of Edward IV and Lady Eleanor Talbot at some point before Edward and Elizabeth Woodville's marriage in 1464. The likely source for this is Bishop Robert Stillington, so I'm going to go with that. There are countless rumors around this accusation. One is that Stillington was a big old liar. One is that he informed Clarence when they were both imprisoned, and Clarence threatened Edward IV with this information, leading to Clarence's execution. And finally, that this accusation was true, and that Stillington had told no one until now. We are confident that Edward IV and Elizabeth Woodville were married in 1464. May 1st is often given as the date. Had Edward been married with a living wife, this would have been bigamous, both a sin and illegal. Now, we know that Lady Talbot died in 1468. Had Stillington witnessed the wedding, he could have easily informed the king, and the king could have corrected the issue of bigamy with both the pope and his wife before it became a legal issue. In fact, Edward could have just remarried Elizabeth Woodville, had their two oldest daughters legitimated by the pope, and the rest of their children would have had nothing to worry about. It would have been scandalous, but it could have been kept quiet. If Stillington was lying, then that's just evil and not within the purview of this show. Had he informed Clarence, and Clarence told the king, why hadn't Edward IV taken care of things then? What's important, though, was at the time of this accusation, both Edward IV and Lady Talbot were deceased. The church didn't recognize marriages without witnesses, and there were no witnesses other than supposedly Stillington. I don't want to get into too much idle speculation, just to give the facts, so I'll stop here with the facts. <laughs> this day also happens to be the day that no further royal grants were made in the young king's name. This accusation, though, will lead directly to the coming events. Due to it, there was a question of legitimacy over the royal children. I can't find out when the Dowager Queen finds out about this accusation. And not knowing makes the next part more difficult. Timing is important when going through this next bit, and we're not 100% sure on these. We know when Richard, Elizabeth's youngest brother, left sanctuary, the 16th of June, 1483, if you're curious but we don't know what his mother knew at the time. William, Baron Hastings, one of Gloucester's closest supporters, at least after the death of Edward IV. Prior to this, he had been a loyal retainer of Edward. He was even married to Warwick's sister Catherine. He remained loyal to Edward IV when Warwick rebelled, but he had a minor feud, likely over a woman with Elizabeth's oldest brother, Thomas. It appears he didn't support the Woodville family having any control in government. After Edward IV's death, he was, of course, the one to inform Gloucester and encouraged him to immediately come to London. Hastings was seemingly loyal to Gloucester until the 13th of June, when he was accused of treason. Some chroniclers have him executed that day, but others have him executed on the 20th of the month. This difference in execution date is telling because Hastings may have changed sides to support the Dowager Queen immediately prior to being accused of treason. The reason I focus on the date of Hastings' death is what happens next. The Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Boucher, you will remember him, convinced the Dowager Queen to turn over her younger son, Richard, 
While Boucher had made the request, Gloucester had troops waiting outside of the abbey, with the implication that he may use them to bring the children out by force. While Princess Elizabeth hadn't spent much time with her brother Edward, she would have spent a great deal more time with Richard. She was, throughout the remainder of her life, very close to her surviving sisters. Had Hastings been executed on the 13th, it's likely the Dowager Queen would have heard about it. But had his execution not occurred until the 20th, there is a chance she thought she had a friend on her side in court still. There were still promises that the young king would be crowned on the 24th of June. The day of Edward V's planned coronation came and went, with no crowns pulled out and no princes seen. The next day would be heartbreaking for Elizabeth and her family. On this day, her older half-brother Richard and her uncle Anthony, a few of their supporters, were executed. Council had not approved of this. That day, though, Council did approve of something. The royal children, Elizabeth and her younger brothers and sisters, were declared bastards. On that same day, Gloucester was petitioned to take the throne. Gloucester was crowned as Richard III on the 6th of July, 1483. Since this episode isn't about Elizabeth's brothers or uncles, either maternal or paternal, let's get back to her. She, her sisters, and their mother were still in sanctuary. With their declaration of illegitimacy, they would have been insulted and their wealth stripped from them. The Dowager Queen was no longer referred to as such. She was referred to by her previous married name, Lady Elizabeth Grey. After Richard III's ascension, a rumor spread that Elizabeth and her sisters had escaped the abbey and fled overseas. This rumor, as expected, upset Richard III, who reinforced his troops that surrounded the abbey. I'm trying to be careful how I talk about Richard III. I'm not on board with the Ricardian movement, but I don't think his actual governing was bad. He seems like a politically sound man who may have made a horrible decision with regards to his nephews. After Richard's July coronation, the overthrown young king and his brother were seen less and less. In early August, one of Richard's first supporters, Henry Stafford, Duke of Buckingham, rebelled along with a large number of supporters, including Thomas Gray, Elizabeth's oldest brother, and Lionel Woodville, her uncle. This rebellion failed, as you may remember, but it did have an outside supporter, I should mention, Henry Tudor. Granted, Henry Tudor was really a supporter in name only. He never actually made it to England for the rebellion. Buckingham's rebellion, as this event was called, failed. And we'll never know why Buckingham rebelled, unless we find his secret journals. The most popular suggestion is that he knew Richard III was planning to kill the princes in the tower. Weir thinks the princes were killed around the 8th of September 1483. Other historians think the boys were killed sometime in late summer 1483. Matthew Lewis, whose work I used for Richard, Duke of York, and other Ricardians don't think they were killed at all. The only thing I can promise is that as of this recording, both the princes in the tower are dead, and have been for at least 400 years. Just saying. Buckingham's rebellion ended with his execution on the 2nd of November. The rebels who weren't captured escaped to Brittany and Henry Tudor's growing rebel court. Throughout this entire period, Elizabeth was in sanctuary with her mother and sisters. After Buckingham's rebellion, her remaining male family members, her uncles and older half-brother, fled to Brittany. Her mother's decision around the rebellion, agreeing to marry her to Henry Tudor, and for the couple to take the throne, make it clear that the Dowager Queen thought her sons were dead. Alice and Weir even suggest that Margaret Beaufort used their go-between to send Elizabeth of York a book to help her throughout her time in sanctuary. Knowing they had supporters on the outside who wanted to see their cause righted would have likely helped the once royal family through this time. While Elizabeth, her mother, and sisters waited, her suggested husband, Henry Tudor, made a bold decision. He visited Wren Cathedral at Christmas time and swore an oath to marry Elizabeth of York on becoming King of England. This was a public oath, which Richard III would have become aware of quickly, and this would have been a threat to him as king. But for Henry Tudor, this was a brilliant move. He had publicly declared his plans, and this would draw others to his banner. Anyone who didn't fully support Richard III, and any remaining Lancastrians, had a clear choice of who to join. This also changed Elizabeth's value. She was no longer the bastard daughter of the late king. She was instead the planned future wife for the man threatening her uncle. 
What did Elizabeth think of all this? No, I have no idea. Alison Weir notes that there is an outline of the name Henry on a page of Elizabeth's Book of Hours that appears to have been erased. But this, in their future relationship, is all we really have. Henry did take the steps of applying for papal dispensation for his planned marriage to Elizabeth. Always a good call, since everyone is related. <laughs> and with that exciting development, I'll pause for this week. Please join me next week for the rest of Elizabeth's story. I'll see you then. Thank you for listening to Past. I can be found on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at PastPod. That's P-A-S-S-E-D-P-O-D. Please feel free to email me at pastpod at gmail.com. I have a Patreon that can be found at patreon.com backslash pastpod.